religious explanation of religion is that God meets world and religion happens. Religion, or true religion at least, is the cultural historical result of our contact with something outside of the world. So if you ask, uh, to be more specific, if you ask a proper Muslim, what explains Islam? At the core of their explanation will be the claim that Allah contacted the world, mediated by Gabriel, and Muhammad received the historically clearest revelation of God's reality to, to man. So, uh, and this is at the core, some version of this will be uh, there at the core of any self-explanation of religion. Today we're focusing on naturalist explanations of religion. And that picture is much simpler. You can see here that the naturalist explanation of religion tries to explain the phenomenon of religion without leaving the natural world. So a successful naturalist explanation of religion will account for all of the data of religion without uh, positing anything supernatural. And um, uh, we'll look at um, <clears throat> a few examples first of naturalist explanations of religion. Naturalist um, tends to involve sciences somewhere above the physical and the chemical. Um, I think it might be hard to reduce religion itself directly to laws of physics, but you, you might reduce aspects of religion to mm, biochemistry. So taking our first example, that unitive mystical, mystical experiences are caused by reduced activity in the posterior superior parietal lobe. This is uh, w one of the um, theories advanced by Andrew Newberg, who uh, has been studying at University of Pennsylvania uh, the neurological basis of mystical experience. He's been doing a very interesting thing. He's been bringing into his lab to have their brains scanned, practiced meditators and contemplatives from the Buddhist and I think Catholic traditions mainly. And Trying, trying to get a handle on what's going on in the brain when these mystics enter these unitive experiences where the boundary between the self and the world temporarily dissolves and experiencers report states of timelessness and selflessness. Well, that might happen, that ecstasy might happen to us once in a while accidentally. These practiced meditators are very good at entering, entering into this state through techniques. And uh, I guess one of the things Newberg found was that this area of the, the brain, the top back of the brain, goes electrically quiet uh, quite often. It's not, I don't think it's universal, but quite often when these mystics are in this state, this part of the brain goes quiet. And we know independently that this part of the brain is strongly associated with um, our, our, our literal physical sense of where we as individuals end and, and where the world begins. So this part of the brain helps us to physically, uh, sort of with our eyes closed, mediate the boundaries of the self. And, and so it's quite interesting, quite revealing that when we feel one with the world mystically, this part of the brain is quiet. Now, I think Newberg, from from what I've read by him, he's he's careful to avoid simplistically reducing unitive experience to uh, brain activity. Um, he, he doesn't say that um, the Catholic interpretation is 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 false because the the experience is just brain activity, but but you can see how if we could accumulate enough correlations between brain states and and religious states, you'd 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 have 
at least a local immediate explanation of what's of what's going on um, <clears throat> in 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 these core experiences of of human religiosity. But, uh, so I, I, this is I'm not positing this example as a as a complete reduction of the religious to the neurophysical, but um, you can see how the the effort here is to ground. Um, you know this this most ethereal experience of of of, of human religion in something uh, natural. Here's here's another very famous example of a naturalistic theory of religion. This one is associated with Ludwig Feuerbach, a nineteenth century German uh, theologian philosopher, and his view is can be summarized as the claim that religion is anthropomorphic projection if you break down that word anthropomorphic it means in the form of man or human anthro for human and morph for form so uh when we anthropomorphize something we 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 uh make it human and uh, we can do this to to uh sponges in in children's cartoons and cars in children's cartoons and Feuerbach said this is what we've been doing in religion and it it's Feuerbach says it's very clear we're doing that in for example let's call it popular hinduism or popular ancient greek uh, polytheism here's shiva and zeus and it's very clear that shiva is a man and zeus is a man um, and it's it's harder to see, Feuerbach says, in these, you know, philosophical, theologic abstractions of the divine nature. This is, if I remember what I captured here, this is a page from Aquinas, a medieval Catholic theologian, describing attributes of of God. And, you know, a sophisticated theist, a philosophically sophisticated theist would say, yes, of course, God is not this and God is not this. God is far beyond any particular bodily manifestation. And that if you if you make the mistake of thinking God is anthro anthropomorphic, um, you just haven't reached the true religion. The true religion is one which understands that God is much more abstract than that and therefore much more magnificent than than anything human like. Feuerbach's claim is 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 that this this later historically later more sophisticated religion actually reduces god into something rather ghost like that the abstraction is actually an abstraction away from anything real and that if we pursue this um, it's really for Feuerbach says it's a psychological revulsion of the idea of anthropomorphism that as we become self-conscious of our anthropomorphic tendencies we we flee them into this abstraction and what we're doing is actually just fleeing the original uh, the original robust religion into a uh mid midway point um or a decompression chamber on the way to atheism. So that this is Feuerbach, in a way, has more admiration for the older, more honest religion, which which just you know t shows the truth of religion. Which religion is just us imagining ourselves projected onto the infinite canvas of the cosmos. And as we get uncomfortable with this 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 very naked anthropomorphism, we we abstract God. We unify the gods into a single being, and then we abstract that being away from its robust qualities, and that becomes the truly unfalsifiable ghost-like god. Um, that is just a check mark on a, you know, uh, um, demographic survey away from atheism. Meaning, meaning the the belief has lost all of its color in life, and it's just a it's just a belief now. Feuerbach says that religion is the childlike condition of humanity. Feuerbach's doing psychology and anthropology. Uh, this is the, the the science. These are the sort of social sciences that Feuerbach is using to construct his naturalistic explanation of religion. Religion is a psychological phenomenon that arises repeatedly, almost you know universally in human cultural history, and it's it's partly. Uh, 
um, Forty Box says it's 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 on the one hand due to our insecurity in in uh, in the face of a indifferent natural world. Nature is actually unconscious and indifferent to our desires, our desire for infinite happiness, and um, faced by uh, this indifferent nature, we 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 uh, imagine a happier story where there are beings supernatural beings, beings who have control over natural processes and who are on our side. So on the one hand, uh, religious projection, anthropomorphic projection, according to Feuerbach, is driven by desire, by the human desire for happiness. So it's a religion is a happy story we tell ourselves about our relationship to, to nature. It's a happy ending. On the other hand, here represented by, by this baby in a mirror, Religion is almost this natural psychologic mistake we make on the way to proper self-awareness. So humans now have a very explicit self-awareness, and we can both at the individual reflective level uh, contemplate our nature, and we also do this at the species level by reflecting on human nature in, in you know, our our parables and in the human sciences. Uh, you might think by, by just canvassing the, hum, uh, the, the earth zoo, uh, if, we, if, if we say that self-awareness of the explicit human form is quite, quite rare, um, then it seems to be an achievement. It seems to be something quite difficult to do, and you might expect that it would then have, you know, mediating stages on, on, on the growth from <clears throat> a total lack of self-awareness to robust self-awareness. And, and Feuerbach says that that's what religion is. Religion is what happens historically uh, as humans are developing full self-consciousness. And so what's going on with this baby? This is a baby confronting itself in a mirror and very happy to meet itself. I'm imagining that the baby here, here's, let's say this is the real baby and that's the mirror baby. And real baby doesn't realize that it's contemplating itself. It thinks it's making a new friend and it's very happy at that fact. And it's making maybe sort of pre-linguistic observations about its new friend. And these observations we can imagine are, are correct. The baby is correctly observing features of its new friend. Everything that the baby believes about this thing is correct, except it's making this one framing mistake. It, it thinks that this baby is a separate being when in fact this reflection is just the baby, baby R itself. And this is what humans have done in religion. Humans in contemplating um, these magnified images of itself in the Shivas and the Zeus's are, are contemplating their own nature, human nature, magnified, infinitized, and therefore easier to anatomize and analyze. And the movement away from religion that Feuerbach was urging us towards is the movement to a mature, explicit form of self-reflection in the form of anthropology and, and psychology. Okay, here's a third uh, style or, or school of naturalistic explanation of religion. This is uh, uh, one following Darwin, treating religion as a very interesting feature of a particular animal on earth. Um, so treating religion as an adaptation that has somehow assisted humans in the game of life. This is a particular version of that Darwinian approach, which, which argues that uh, religion's specific function is to increase group cohesion. So here, here are examples of adaptations. An adaptation can be a physical feature of the organism, like the rabbit's ears and associated uh, you know, developments in its, what, its audio cortex to help it among other things, uh, quickly detect um, 
predators emerging into its field of perception. And then you've got maybe once it realizes a hawk is on the scene, it will stomp as a warning to its fellow rabbits and as a maybe to get the blood running into the hind legs to get ready to sprint. Uh, probably the stomping behavior which is, is a multivalent um, signal and has many functions in the rabbit's, um, the rabbit's repertoire. But um, it's a behavior. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a behavior that has some kind of adaptive logic. It helps the rabbit survive and ultimately reproduce. So adaptations can be uh, things in the organism and then behaviors the way those things are used in the um, behavior in the in, in the organism's life and then doing our alien flyby the alien anthropologist flying over saudi arabia sees mecca and sees its magnificence mm -hmm. and understands that something that the, the animal is putting a lot of energy into this uh, into this architecture, into the circumambulation of the of the Kaaba stone. Here's a so this is the Mecca is a structure. It's it's like the rabbit ear a little bit, though it's extended from the human body. It's it's part of our extended phenotype. We've extended our own um, interests into a fixed physical environment through this architecture. And maybe like the rabbit ear, or the better analogy would be something like the beaver dam or the spider web. It uh, it serves some function. Here's a human behavior singing in in choir practice. <clears throat> what what is it for? Thinking like uh, an alien biologist observing the human primate, we'd ask just as we'd ask of the rabbit ear, what is this for, and what is what is this for? Well, uh, David Sloan Wilson argues it's to increase group cohesion, that religion, that, a, you know, a tribe who has religion will in the long run do better than a tribe who doesn't because religion is, is, is a set of techniques that get us to work um, more effectively with each other. We're, we're an extremely social species that relies on each other for our survival, right? I mean, some, some animals emerge from their mother literally hitting the ground running, ready to go, and somewhat independently viable, but humans emerge from their mothers sort of as exteriorized fetuses for, for a time. So from, from our very earliest moments on Earth, we are extremely dependent on, on each other for, for our survival. And this carries on um, into the wider life of the tribe. So um, coordinated group action is, is crucial for human survival and religion. The broad story here is religion would be a set of um, beliefs and practices that uh, get us to play well with each other and therefore uh, get us to individually do, do better. Here's the the uh, dark, maybe cynical Marxist view of religion. I mean, the the the, the Marxist interpretation of religion will be uh, various and complex. But this is uh, this is the most famous Marxist statement on what religion is. The Marxist view of history is that history can be reduced to um, history of class conflict between the haves and the have-nots, and Religion in this Marxist vision has played a role in upholding state power, upholding the power of the 1% over the 99%. I'm, I'm speaking a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, I'm sure. But uh, we, see, we see the role of religion, uh, first of all, here in Pope Leo crowning Charlemagne, the great European monarch, <clears throat> this is a, a, a perfect picture for the Marxist of the relation between religion and state power. Religion is, in the form of the Pope, um, crediting and um, um, affirming the legitimacy of not just this particular king, not just Charlemagne, but 
affirming more generally the legitimacy of the whole system Charlemagne and the Pope operate within. The Pope is, as it were, saying God approves of this system. That's what this, this crowning ceremony says. God approves of extremely hierarchical, <laughs> unequal relations among humans. And, uh, you know, we, we can talk in detail about how religion does this, but w one of religion's neat tricks, according to the Marxist, would be uh, getting the 99% to go along with this system um, by focusing their energy on another world. And that's why I have the Sermon on the Mount pictured here. This is Jesus speaking to the poor huddled masses and telling them that a better world awaits them. I mean, uh, this is one of the messages of the Beatitudes, um, that this world is short and temporary, and yes, yes, often full of suffering for many of us, but there's an infinite uh, better world that awaits us, where in fact the, the rich man has a hard time getting in, and the, the poor are accepted, and, and, and their fortune is, is reversed. And I mean, maybe this is true, maybe this is the true gospel news of, of, of what's going on, but you could see how, uh, if, if you could get the 99% to believe this, that would... Uh, remove a lot of their motivation to revolt in this world. Why would you uh, de devote your energy to radically remaking the political order if this if this this is a crumbling empire by its very nature? It's it's occurring within the sands of temporal um, existence and God's kingdom awaits us all. So r religion and its its various Religion is a set of techniques which we don't have to imagine were consciously, conspiratorially um, um, devised by the 1% to hold sway over the 99%. In fact, uh, a, a, a really effective religious ideology will be believed by all the participants in the system. A very effect, effective king might be one who believes quite sincerely that he is God's appointed on earth and that God approves of him and his system. He'll more effectively rule with that kind of um, confidence. But um, the opiate of the masses, the opium, which which gets the masses to accept with equanimity and even pleasure the suffering of the current political order. I mentioned David Sloan Wilson, uh, the work where he works out his theory that religion is an adaptation to increase group cohesion. It's called Darwin's Cathedral. And uh, so if you're taking the Darwinian lens on religion, you can begin maybe thinking of religion as an adaptation, as something that that assists the organism who possess, possesses it. But Dennett points out that that from the Darwinian lens, you could also think about religion as a, a virus. That's That's another thing it could be. Um, or elements of religion could be viral, meaning we are the host and religion is the virus, which is somehow getting itself spread by co-opting our own reproductive machinery. Uh, <clears throat> this really um, is expressed nicely in Susan Blackmore's example of the useless internet memeplex which bears close analogy to a very common religious idea. So here is here's something people from my generation of 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 <clears throat> computer use remember. These used to show up in our inbox all the time. I'm thinking back to the to the 90s maybe before spam filters were at all effective. Warning warning news just in from IBM or Bill Gates or whatever the current uh, popular authority of techno culture is a terrible virus warn all your friends immediately that, that if they open a mail called blah blah whatever it is uh, the name changes in the variations of this meme plex their hard disk will be wiped clean so this is this is a meta virus it's a it's a bit of it's a it's a uh, a bit of code meaning just a sequence of english words which appear in the content of your email message which are about a putative executable virus. And <laughs> the, th the thing is there, is, there is no such virus that's going around. The virus is the actual email message. This is the virus, and it's not an executable program. 
It's not that by opening this particular message and reading it, your hard drive is now going to be wiped. It's that you worry that this warning is true, and then you warn all your friends. How do you do it? You open up your address book and click, 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 quickly send it off to 10 associates. And of those 10, maybe five get worried like you do and send it off to 10 of their associates. And you can see oh, very quickly by trading on lack of information and fear, this bit of information, which is all a virus is, if we want to be a bit reductive, this bit of information could spread very quickly through a social ecosystem. And, and Blackmore says, <laughs> This has a sort of chemical structure, this bit of information, that we can reduce whatever the content of this message or its variance is. It, they, it's, a, its effectiveness can be understood by reducing it to this very simple core message, CTAP. Copy me. The C means copy me. And that's annexed. That, that, that request to be copied is annexed to threats and promises. So please copy me. And if you don't copy me, bad things will happen to you and your loved ones and good things. In this case, the good thing will just be the bad thing not happening <laughs> to you. Uh, I'm sure you've seen emails which promise good things to you if you pass the message on and explicitly warn about bad things. Uh, you know, the, um, say, say 10 Hail Marys and good things will come to you if you pass this particular Hail Mary request, request on to 10 of your friends and terrible things will happen if you don't. So that's, um, I mean, that's an interesting case of, a, of an internet memeplex spread by email, which itself has an explicitly religious content. And indeed, Blackmore says that this CTAP structure can, can be discerned at the heart of the theistic religions. If you think about what the copy me instruction is in Islam and Christianity, it's um, spread the word. And the threats and the promises are the good things that will come to those who believe and spread the word and the bad things that will come to those who don't heaven and hell most dramatically. And whether or not the gospel news is true, you could see how it would be likely to spread if it was framed in the right way, right? If we put warning, warning news just in from I don't know, Kleenex Corporation here, um, that version of the meme would be less likely to spread by email. But if we, if we frame it right and refer to a relevant techno authority, then people are more likely to gullibly accept the information and the warning. And similarly, if the CTAP religious message is framed appropriately, maybe for example, with very beautiful choral masses sung in a very beautifully designed cathedral and, uh, um, uh, expanded upon in sermon by a uh, charismatic, symmetrically attired um, um, priestly authority, the religious CTAP structure could spread quite wide and far, or you can imagine a whole ecology of competing religious CTAPs. Um, and over history, a couple will emerge into dominance, and that's what we've seen. We've seen Christianity and Islam together account for now the the uh, majority of human religiosity. You could understand their success as just the long life of a particular CTAP um, message. Again, we're being a little bit reductive here, but you can see, in the, again, in the spirit of the naturalistic explanation of, of religion, we're using just some social psychology and a little bit of insight from Darwinian logic to explain the success and spread of religion. Religion is the thing we're trying to explain, the fact that religion undoubtedly is here on earth. And maybe we can explain a lot of its uh, persistence by, uh, by this mimetic route.
So here's a definition of a meme. A meme is a unit of information that replicates and spreads through communication from mind to mind, so not through physical sexual contact, as in the case of genes, but uh, through social contact. So if you didn't know the word meme before, this slide appeared in your in your um, purview. You you now have just received the meme of the word meme, and it's in your head. It went from my head onto the slide <laughs> and into your head, and through so so this purely social contact, the meme of the word meme has has spread. And uh, so you can we're, we're to think of the meme as the unit or uh, almost um, the currency of. Um, social cultural evolution analogous to the gene, which is the unit of um, biologic evolution, and both operate under the influence of this triple engine of evolution, variation, selection, and transmission. You get a variety of memes, a variety of that, that uh, email warning, and then there will be selection from among them. That is, some will get passed on and some will just die in the first inbox they land in. And there's some mechanism of transmission. Uh, our language is transmittable. <clears throat> uh, it's, it's shared code and through the electronic infrastructure and we can pass the meme from place to place from person to person and y you give a cultural ecosystem enough time and and you know some memes will emerge dominant and will will spread just like we've seen in in biologic space over the last 4 billion years Okay, let's talk about Daniel Dennett's uh, writing on religion, his, his work, Breaking the Spell, which you have some excerpts from, is, is an attempt to explain religion naturalistically. He doesn't have a single shot theory analogous to Feuerbach's projection theory. Uh, uh, he's got a kind of a toolbox of, of, of theories drawing from social sciences, from cognitive science, certainly largely from Darwinian theory. And I've just pulled from the readings three three ideas. Uh, these are, each of these are, uh, you can think of these as memes or meme plexes. Had is a meme. It's a uh, tendency or practice. And shamanic induction is a cultural uh, ritualized practice, which itself would be a complex meme. And then what are called exopsychic decision procedures. These are successful meme plexes in in human history, which, according to Dennett, can each of them explain a significant chunk of of religious life. So taking Had first, <laughs> this is an overly uh, scientific sounding name for um, um, our ability to detect in our immediate environment agent. An agent is anything with a mind of its own. So the rabbit is certainly an agent and the hawk that the rabbit is on the on the on the lookout for is also an agent. The hawk has a mind of its own and intentions of its own and um, evil intentions relative to the rabbit the hawk wants to catch and eat the rabbit and the rabbit wants to get away from the hawk and it's very much in the rabbit's interest to be conscious of the moment the hawk enters uh, the rabbit's environment so the rabbit can take evasive maneuvers in fact it's in the interest of all life to be hyperactively aware of other agents in its environment not just predatorial agents but conspecifics that one might mate with or um uh, coordinate action with. It's very much in the interest of, of animals to very quickly distinguish in their environment the agents from the background of insentient non-agency and to focus their um, attention on the agents since so much of their well-being is caught up with those agents.
So nature has endowed us all with a hyperactive agent detection device or had this just this just refers to a complex of um, probably nervous system features and behaviors that let us um, <clears throat> quickly become cognizant of agents in our environment and the hyperactive point is, is key here that it's I mean if, if, if nature's got to make a, a, a sort of design compromise so to speak in 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 in, in endowing us with this agent detection device and it has to choose between a hyperactive device and a and a hypoactive device uh, right it, it can't design a perfectly uh, correct detection device it's got to err on one side or the other it's it's much better for the rabbit to have a hyperactive device that is um, for the rabbit to get sure some false positives and and stomp and run off when it's just the wind blowing through the trees and it's not not an approaching hawk it's much better better that the rabbit daily makes that kind of mistake repeatedly than once every 10 days has an underperforming detection device that uh, doesn't get the rabbit excited about what turns out to be an approaching hawk and the rabbit gets eaten so uh, again just thinking through the darwinian lens it's going to be uh, we're going to likely develop hyperactivity in this kind of detection and this hyperactivity is going to um, fill our environment with agents that aren't there right especially as dennett says in a species as ours with with this inner imaginative theater and this linguistic ability to uh, convey the contents of our inner theater to um, our tribe members we can um, our, our, our hyperactive agent detection device uh, produces hawks that aren't there and then we uh, magnify in our mind's eye the features of this hawk and then um, uh, communicate our belief in the existence of this super hawk to our tribe members and these super hawks are the the gods and the entities that populate uh the local ecology or ecologic view of humans and in, in our universal history that our 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 belief in our environment includes not just the actual physical flora and fauna but it's uh, superimposed on this this base ecology is 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 the super ecology of all the entities we've imagined into existence through had the wind uh whispering through the trees becomes a wind god right and so this then it doesn't suggest that through had alone we can explain the birth of all the gods but this would be uh, this kind of paradolic projection would would be one of the funding sources of the theologic ecology mentioned pareidolia we talked about pareidolia when we talked about possible explanations of synchronicity experience and i i took the overhead picture of mecca here and just folded it along a, a y-axis or doubled it along a y-axis here and you can see when you do that with any complex image you'll tend to get something quite face-like uh, you'll get bilateral or bi bilateral symmetry which is what most animals have and so you'll get eye-like spots symmetrically aligned uh, um, across the axis you'll get some centralized spots <laughs> beneath the the eyes and yeah, not something nose like and i guess we got a mouth here in fact i kind i kind of maybe i got rabbit on the brain but i kind of see something a little bit rabbit like especially with that pointed tiny mouth <clears throat> I guess this is a rabbit with its hands up. Don't arrest me. I don't know. Anyway, this is testament to our weird pareidolic um, capacity, which is the capacity of the had. <clears throat> Shamanic induction is the the uh, hypnotic induction. What what is the shaman doing in the healing ritual? Well, an objective anthropologist might say they're they're inducing hypnosis in the patient and why do they do this well dennett drawing on on other research points out that hypnosis uh, has medical benefits uh, a limited range of medical benefits uh, including analgesic benefits 
And as then it says, uh, uh, before the age of modern healthcare, in 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 for most of our tribal past your susceptibility to hypnosis was your health insurance. That is, uh, if you're susceptible to hypnosis in the presence of, a, of an appropriately marked religious authority, you can uh, enjoy the benefits, the medical benefits of hypnosis. And so there will be a kind of selective pressure for susceptibility to hypnosis, maybe something as specific as susceptibility to hypnosis in the presence of a certain kind of marked authority and uh so f f um those susceptible to hypnosis will gain this med medical benefit those not susceptible will uh, not gain this benefit and so you could uh, susceptibility could spread as a trait in the human species <laughs> how much of human relig religious experience involves something like <laughs> our susceptibility to religiously garbed authorities in ritualized circumstances uh, where through this uh, hypnotic induction the, the 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 shaman is remaking the contents of our mind through hypnotic suggestion the shaman is telling the patient you will be by the power of the gods you will be healed and the patient believes it in the hypnotic state all the rational defenses ordinarily the patient might possess are, are bypassed in the state of hypnosis and one has to wonder but skeptically how much of religious life is just this you know dyad writ large and and complexified and uh, finally a third idea we're drawing from daniel dennett exopsychic decision procedures so a decision procedure is a way of making up your mind. For example, you might draw up a little pro-con chart and, and figure out you know, the benefits of, of, of taking on a part-time job while you're in school and the, the negatives of that in the, in the con column and then, and then you know, weigh the options and compare them or weigh the outcomes and then come to a come to a decision that would be an example of a rational decision procedure using your mind and the facts available to you to make up your mind about about what to do an exopsychic decision procedure is a way of making up your mind without using your mind exo means outs, outside and psyche is the greek word for the mind uh, so it would be making up your mind without using your mind. Flipping a coin would be, the, the, I think, our most common example of that. When you flip a coin, you're saying, I don't want to make up my mind using any mental energy. I will outsource the decision procedure to this non-mental event. And its output will guide my behavior. And the coin flip is 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 a uh, a secular <laughs> uh, decision procedure we we use typically for very trivial choices who's 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 that that we're indifferent between. So you know if if, if you're if you've decided you're going to kill kill three hours of your afternoon by watching a crappy movie, and it's between you know Iron Man Part Seven and um, I don't know. Um, cars 19 you might say well uh you know I'll, I'll just flip a coin and let the coin decide which which movie i go to but in religious history according to dennett we've been using sort of tr um, dressed up coin flips to guide our behavior dressed up to get the get the outputs to stick so uh, we won't use a coin flip to decide whether to go to war with the neighboring city um uh, we just don't take the coin flip seriously enough but if we dress the coin up in religious garb if we if we call the coin the sacred disc and um, instead of flipping it, we say we are sending the, the disc to the heavens um, and the disc returns to the hand that catches it with, with a, a fresh news from the gods, uh, guidance for our behavior. And we believe this. We believe that that's what, what's going on in the coin flip. We'll, we'll take the 
coins output quite quite seriously and uh so uh, the, quest, the question here is what percentage of human religious behavior is in effect or at heart a exopsychic decision procedure if you look at astrology and bellomancy and augury these are all decision procedures which have in their original environments uh religious um context to to give them authority and to give the users of these systems confidence in their in their actions jane's view is that these precision uh, decision procedures proliferate in the ancient environment when when humans uh, leave the tribe and enter the city and scale up very quickly and life becomes very confusing and stressful very quickly we use these decision procedures to alleviate the extreme stress of the the city and its its new decision situations uh so so this is uh if you think of these as as memes these decision procedures think of astrology as, as a complex meme there would be some you know um motivation for us to adopt it adopt it and spread it because it alleviates stress or or pain Jane's defines stress as a situation where the the animal can't make up its mind and and must <clears throat> and and so uh these decision procedures would help to alleviate uh, the stress of decision making and again the question is what percentage of, of 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 ongoing religious behavior is is just humans alleviating the stress of decision making by um, outsourcing the decision to something outside of their their mind well what do these situations all have in common prophet isaiah and ezekiel and then here we have hesiod and eve in each case there's a dyad there's hesiod and the muse there's eve and the serpent and then there's the prophets and their angelic messengers this is a, a dyad of a human receiver and a divine or some form superhuman communicator bringing information to the human this this dyad is widely reflected in in our storytelling it's often at the heart of our stories uh, donnie darko and the shining are both um, stories about individuals who are marked for this reception and the drama of each story is is generated from the problems this information and it's 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 very reception creates for the protagonist and his and his world and here the same dyad the same pair of a human receiver of divine information this is the god sharma holding and advising the king tudalia here on the right we have king hamurabi listening to the god marduk these representations are are uh, common in ancient narrative and ancient history even uh, julian jaynes will argue that this is probably a historical depiction of an actual event uh, not in james's view an actual supernatural deity communicating to a human ruler but it's a psychologically realistic portrayal of an experience that that hammurabi and tudalia underwent and this is really james's james's theory of the bicameral man the bicameral era 
James's view is that if we wind the clock back about 3,000 years, we come to a profound shift in human experience, maybe the most important shift in all uh, the history of civilization. Prior to 3,000 years ago, according to Jains, humans, bicameral man means bicameral, humanity, um, humans could not introspect or deliberate. Uh, introspect means look within. To introspect is to reflect on one's own nature, on the contents of one's own consciousness, its self-awareness. And according to Jains, I mean, this is something we all possess now to, to varying degrees. Some people are uh, maybe excessively self-reflective to the point that it stultifies action. But all of us have this capacity to uh, close the eyes and to train uh, extrospection onto the self and hopefully gain wisdom for deliberation sometimes from that introspection. Uh, bicameral means having two chambers, according to Jaynes, instead of self-reflecting. 3,000 years ago, we would um, hear the authoritative commands of what seemed to us an external authority, a god or a deceased ancestor in most cases. And we would receive this voice as, as instruction and we would act on the basis of, the, of this instruction um, without, without any deliberation or without any hemming and hawing that, that instead of making up our own mind in the deep ancient past, a God would make up our mind for us. So here's the bicameral era. Here's the overview picture of Jainesian history. Here's now. Here's Jesus, and then here's a thousand years before Jesus, a thousand BC. And that is the dividing point between the bicameral era and we shouldn't call it the modern era, but the era of, of what we now associate with modern consciousness, this Hamletic capacity for self, self reflection. In fact, uh, predates Hamlet, it goes, we see signs of it developing in, the, in this era. But if you go back to 1000 BC and prior, according to Jains, you will search in vain in the historic record for evidence of what we would today recognize as, as genuine self-reflection. This is an astonishing hypothesis. And uh, when Jains' work, his book-length treatment of this hypothesis came out in 76, it was a bit, of a bit of a sensation, you know, by the standards of scholarship's impact on, on popular culture. It got a little time uh, right up in... Time magazine, and a lot of people read it outside of academic psychology. In fact, uh, Philip K. Dick read it and was very aware of Jaynes's work and, in fact, wrote a letter to Julian Jaynes to, to tell Jaynes, you know, you're right, uh, but the gods are real, I think was, was Dick's, Dick's view. I don't think Jaynes wrote back, but, but we don't have record of that. Search in vain, says Jaynes, for evidence prior to 1000 BC of reflective self-awareness of the self of the human individual deliberating in their mind about what to do. And Jane says, in fact, if you look at the records we have of, of, of that era, of, of the psychology of, of humanity prior to 1000 BC, we find this dyad that that humans, when they reach a crisis in the flow of action, when they come to a, a, a node in the decision tree that they can't uh, decide upon through sort of autonomic, uh, just cultural, culturally programmed action, they stress out, um, as, as all animals do when they reach um, the point of not knowing what to do. And their stress crosses a certain threshold. And according to Jaynes, they psychologically uh, hallucinate a god. So this is a famous moment in the Iliad, in the, in the ancient Greek epic, where the warrior Achilles receives instruction from Athena. Achilles is 
not sure what to do. He's stressing. And then Athena appears to him and speaks to him and tells him what to do. And for the ancients, that was the alleviation of stress. They maybe now had to do something hard that the gods were um, commanding of them, but at least they knew what, what to do. According to Jane's gods take the place of consciousness by consciousness. Read that as self-reflection and in the bicameral era instead of the capacity to self-reflect we would hallucinate a deity who told us what to do so we we see this is a this is i mean james didn't set out to explain religion he set out to explain um i think initially some some interesting parallels between what he was noticing in his clinical interaction with with modern schizophrenics and then reports in the ancient record of this uh, kind of experience and uh, the bicameral thesis arose from from i think that that connection but in effect almost as as, as a happy byproduct of his explanation of consciousness james has a sort of naturalist theory of religion a large part of religion is the um, organization of schizophrenic or quasi schizophrenic um, hallucination of authoritative voices which guide our actions. So the gods are the settled personalities we assign to these voices and religion is our attempt to propitiate these voices to call them down as they fade away as we leave the bicameral air the the voices fade and we use the temple as a an amplifier of our voices in chorus to to call the gods back to return us to the happier time when uh, someone told us what to do uh, so you've got this very interesting uh, theory of of religion or a good bulk of what we call religion implied in james's bicameral theory. Search the historic record in vain for evidence of self-reflection, though there's an, there are some exceptions, but according to Jane's, the exceptions prove the rule. So in the Iliad, according to Jane's, you'll, now I'm no, I'm, no, I'm no scholar of the Iliad, but according to Jane's in his, in his thorough reading of it, there's really just one instance in the entire book length poem that is the Iliad, where you find a character um, reflecting on their own consciousness and deliberating. And after they do it, they say this. This is a really weird line. And some of the weirdness is maybe in the English translation, but uh, Agenor, and then this, this very same situation is repeated sort of verbatim by, by Hector. Agenor says, but wherefore does my life say this to me? Agenor says this after uh, um, snapping out of the trance of deliberation he's been been mired in he's he starts thinking about what to do as we might do we might say uh, maybe i should do this maybe i should do that we we sort of crazily <laughs> talk to ourselves when we don't know what to do we do it usually in our head but often we do it out loud and agenor has has just been doing this he's just been wondering to himself what to do but this is, according to James, clearly a novel, disturbing experience for Agnor because he snaps out of it and then says this very odd thing. But wherefore does my life say this to me? It seems like Agnor is so confused by this, what for us would be just just, just very ordinary bit of self-reflection. He doesn't even have the language to describe self-reflection how he's saying how is it that my life is speaking to me <laughs> rather than a god for us it's inverted right for us if a god spoke to us we'd jump out of our chair and as as, as, as james himself does he, he he describes how in the writing of um his book or in 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 the um thinking through in his solitude this bicameral theory he was he, he received a bicameral hallucination a voice spoke to him as he was lying on his couch in boston and said include the knower in the known and james jumped out of his james jumped out of his couch and for a moment to his embarrassment started searching searching for the physical source of that voice for the location of the signal and then i guess laughed and realized he had just suffered a bicameral 
hallucination. <coughs> but James was shocked by this this appearance of the God voice in in modern times and in ancient times in the bicameral era. Agenor and Hector were shocked by the incursion of self reflection and did not have the language to describe it. So this is the exception that proves the rule. You will find a couple of instances in the Iliad and maybe elsewhere in the record of of the appearance of what seems to be self-reflection, but the way the way the reflection is reacted to and framed, at least in this case, shows shows that the, the bicameral theory is correct. That's that's what James would say. Consciousness is is weird, and um, the annals of psychology are filled with strange anomalies or um, um, behaviors like blindsight. If you read the works of Oliver Sacks, you'll find a litany of these, these strange phenomena, which, which, which are often disruptions of what we call normal consciousness, which, which maybe show that there's, there's something very strange about consciousness to begin with. Uh, and it's, it's revealed to us in these little ruptures. But blindsight is, is a absolutely fascinating, somewhat horrifying phenomenon where the patient who has typically suffered some kind of um, uh, lesion or brain injury reports as blind. And uh, if we take them at their word, they're sincerely devoid of what we call visual experience. They don't seem to see their environment. But in careful tests, uh, neurologists, psychologists can show that in fact the blindsided patient is is perceiving the world around them. Uh, so you can you can ask the patient to describe what's on the screen in front of them, and and usually the the, the patient will protest and say, "I told you, doc, I'm, I'm blind." But um, but if you insist that they just maybe guess at an answer, they'll they'll guess at a rate far above um, random. And uh, this shows that the blindsided patient is processing information, incoming light from their environment. And it's, it's not only being received by their, uh, I don't know, their visual cortex, but it's also being, that information is being shared with their language centers beneath the purview of explicit self-awareness so that when you press them for linguistic output, they give you uh, information about their environment informed by, by the incoming visual data. But the, they are not aware of the incoming visual data and they don't consciously uh, connect that data to, to, to their linguistic performance. So blind sight is an example of awareness without self-awareness, you could say, or perception and behavior, very complex social behavior, answering a question in a psychology test, um, which is un, unmediated by reflective self-awareness, in this case, uh, just, just visual experience itself. And these sorts of experiences. James uses the more mundane example of uh, just spacing out while you're driving. We, we, if you've ever driven, you know that there are many stretches of driving, especially on a long straight highway at night where you're not consciously directing the car, but uh, you know, your mind is somewhere else. It's in conversation with, with a fellow passenger or um, it's, it's changing the radio or it's thinking about the day's events and uh, you're sort of autonomically handling the uh, complex perception and behavior required to navigate the car and keep it straight. And so that mundane experience of spacing out while driving and, and more exotic phenomena like blind sight help James's theory because, you know, if the ancients, though they lacked self-awareness, they were capable of very complex behavior. And for that reason, when you when you read a work like the Iliad, you're James would say you're 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 being confronted with, on the one hand, people who are very familiar to you. They they are a lot like you in their hopes and desires and behavior and obsessions. But they are also a little bit alien. I think I think 
part of our obsession with the ancient world is that we we feel we're confronting there a form of life that is like us but but distant and um, almost eerily alien and and jane says indeed they are alien if you go back before 1000 bc they lack self-consciousness and uh, so jane's calls the characters of the iliad noble automata who are being pushed throughout the map of the ancient world by by the god voice so Jane's needs to explain how complex human behavior would be possible even without self-awareness and blindsight and related phenomena show that a person can behave without, without the expected internal theater accompanying that behavior. Here's a timeline. Uh, zoomed in and here's Jesus again and here's about 200 BC and here's 800 BC and then here's a thousand BC here's the great dividing line according to Jane of the bicameral era and the post bicameral era or the era of um, schizophrenic hallucination of God voices and then the dwindling of that voice and its eventual quieting uh, the voice may be mostly removed from human experience now and relegated to the exotic uh, um, phenomena of psychopathology or what we identify as psychopathology. So, uh, I, you know, we're not going to get too much into Jane's explanation of why it happens at this particular time, but it has largely to do with what's called the Bronze Age Collapse, which was a series of calamities that befell the, the Near East um, in around uh, 1200 BC. I mean, a, a complex of, you know, perfect storm of natural disasters, and then maybe um, the effects of that in mass migrations and uh, famines and war. There's a collapse of civilization um, a domino like collapse and there's you know uh, historians still speculate about about what happened it might be one of these complexes we never figure out but something profound happened and and so as i said we won't get into james's particular explanation but it wouldn't be surprising that it's around here that there's a profound shift in human consciousness that the the stress the extreme stress of this unprecedented collapse um, requires humanity very quickly to develop a new um, um, uh, more flexible decision procedure that that the decision procedure of just listening to what the the god voice told you was sufficient in a relatively stable civilization the god voice remember is not god according to james the god voice is when it's well functioning the encoding of your own culture's wisdom it's 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 the 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 conclusions your culture has drawn over long trial and error of the, of, the, of the generations about how to behave, how to react in these stressful situations. And that voice could actually be quite wise in a well-run, stable civilization. But as the borders between civilizations start to dissolve and you're confronted with increasingly novel situations, that voice, which which is wisdom that takes a long time to, to evolve and be encoded, that voice is no longer very useful. So real-time internal deliberation where you're you're taking in your environment and then in real time reflecting on what to do, that's a much more agile uh, form of deliberation. So Bronze Age climb, you know, I said I wouldn't get into the explanation, but I've just, just summed up Julian, uh, Julian James's account of why the shift happens then. Um, so Bronze Age collapse um, requires a new decision procedure. But this is something, is such a pr profound shift, it's not going to happen overnight. It's not like, you know, mm, 1001 BC, we were all hearing the God voice, and then in 999 BC, we were all 
pontificating to ourselves like Hamlet. This is going to be a process that is, is ongoing. In fact, we still see, you know, a sample of the current human population, some people who self-reflect with facility and some who, who find it very difficult and are only do it when pushed into it in extreme in situations of extreme stress. So you'd expect, I mean, just if, if you were told that the shift happens here at 1000 BC, you'd expect that in, 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 in the centuries afterwards, you'll see a fading of the bicameral consciousness. So you still see evidence of the God voice here. But what, what you'd expect is that the, the receptivity to this voice will become increasingly rare. And so this is the golden era of, of what we call prophecy. <clears throat> prophecy is, you know, the Jainsian view, uh, receptivity to the hallucinations in an era when most people have lost that capacity. And so the prophets are specially marked by their culture, like Amos. Uh, let's talk about Amos first. Um, specially marked by their culture and still respected by their culture. Uh, so in, in the immediate post bicameral era, there's, there's cultural memory of the God voice and respect for that God voice. And so those who can still hear it are uh, taken seriously. Jaynes looks at Amos and identifies Amos as the, the historically oldest of the books of the, of the Jewish scriptures. And so we'd expect in, in the language of Amos to find very clear traces of that bicameral consciousness, just a couple hundred years out of the bicameral era. And if you, if you look at Amos, read, read just, you know, some sample um, uh, verses from Amos, uh, you'll see he prefaces a lot of them with this, this stereotype phrase, thus speaks the Lord. So Amos is saying, you can, uh, um, here's what God is saying right now. Amos is just this transmitting radio who's receiving the bicameral hallucination and then reporting it or transmitting it to his, his, his listeners. Um, he's, he's, uh, quoting, quoting Yahweh. There's very little evidence of self-reflection. When you get to Ecclesiastes, it's very different. Ecclesiastes has this stereotype phrase of, and then I said in my heart, which is a very awkward, long-winded way of saying, you know, I'm thinking, I, I was thinking, uh, life is hard. I was thinking all is vanity. I was thinking, in fact, we today don't even say I was thinking, we just say what we're thinking. But you would imagine in the burgeoning centuries of, of self-consciousness, the articulators of self-consciousness will have to signal to their listener, okay, I'm about to give you reports from my own, from my own heart or my own mind. Uh, but anyway, we see from 800 to be, uh, 800 BC to 200 BC in the biblical record of the prophets, a shift from just very bicameral transmission of the Yahweh voice to the self-reporting of a Hamlet-like, reflective, somewhat depressive human, human spirit. So Jaynes did not set out to explain religion, but, but he received in his explanation of consciousness a byproduct of a natural explanation of religion. And religion has two phases, as, as you'd expect in his historical story. There's the, what religion was before the shift and then what religion is after the shift. So to sum up, Jaynes's you know, natural explanation of religion there are two. In the bicameral era, religion is a culture's organization of the God voices. And it's the narratives which frame the God's messages and maybe prepare us to receive and interpret those messages. Um, and it's rituals which assist the reception of those messages and their implementation into, into human action. 
after the bicameral shift, religion is uh, the nostalgic anguish for the lost bicamerality of a subjectively conscious people. So now, let's say, let's jump forward 3,000 years after the shift, now we call out to God. God does not speak directly to us now, typically. If he does, we start to worry about our own sanity. But we call out to God and uh, seek um, in God's mysterious movements, sign of some some answers. This is this is a, a sort of tragic comic picture. James's painting of modern religion, where uh, there's a part of us which is just which really wants to be bicameral. That it's it's hard to be um, fully responsible for your own for your own decisions, and so we call out to the God for answers and for guidance. So religion today is 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 the organization of our nostalgic anguish for the gods. And you can think of the temple as this great amplifier we, we enter into and then attempt to call down the gods to us. Our obsession with with divination and with synchronicities. This this is typical of a of a people who can't speak to God directly anymore. Our obsession with theology, with inferring God's existence through subtle philosophical argumentation. This is all what you'd expect to flourish in a post-bicameral culture who has uh, nostalgia for, for the relationship with God.